to oh. engine repair two test eleven. We're sort of having a working lunch here, aren't we? Huh? All right. Technician A says the paper test could detect a burned valve. Technician B says a grayish white stain on the engine could be a coolant leak. Mm, what do you think about that? Both of those guys are right. Grayish white is what color antifreeze is after it burns um, and becomes a dry crust. Two technicians are discussing oil leaks. Technician A says an oil leak can be found using a fluorescent dye in the oil with a black light to check for leaks. Technician B says a white spray powder can be used to locate oil leaks. Oh. Yeah, you can use white spray powder. Dr. Scholl's foot powder works good for that. Which of the following is the least likely to cause an engine noise? Loose belt, carbon on the pistons, cracked exhaust manifold, or vacuum leak? You're not likely to hear all the time a vacuum leak. Sometimes you'll hear a vacuum leak, sometimes you won't. So vacuum leak is going to be the right answer to that one. That's going to be the D. A good engine should produce how much compression during a dynamic compression test at idle. Now that means you've got the compression gauge screwed in there and you've got it idling with a compression gauge in there and you're going to see how much uh, with the engine idling. What do you think? It's actually D, 60 to 90. It's not going to be as much as it's going to be spinning over. Okay. A smoothly operating engine depends on what? A. Cylinder compression levels above 100 PSI and within 70 PSI of each other. B. Compression levels below 100 PSI on most cylinders. C. High compression on most cylinders. Or D. Equal compression between cylinders. D. Equal compression between cylinders. A good reading for a cylinder leakage test would be... A. A. Below 20% leakage on all cylinders. Now who in here has not done a cylinder leakage test? Have you done a cylinder leakage test with that little manifold with the two gauges on it? We put them in there and it tells you how much leakage you got. Um, was anybody involved in troubleshooting that engine on that F-150 before we swapped it out? Any else? You remember what we did was webbing them when they were coming here, it was skipping on five. That white one that you put the motor in, but mm -hmm. they, they troubleshot it before you got it. And that it was, we huh? put the motor in. Yeah, y'all did that, but... Uh, yeah, you and you and her both did that. I mean, I didn't mean to leave you out, Melissa. I'm sorry. But anyway, what happened was uh, we were checking compression, and it only had 70 pounds of compression on that cylinder. And so we got it to TDC using our tools that we had, you know, and uh, making sure it was on TDC compression. And then we uh, pumped smoke into it. You remember that? It had 70% cylinder leakage, too. Uh, that 70 and 70 was interesting. 70 pounds of compression, 70% cylinder leakage. And we just left it with the valves where the valves were supposed to be closed. And we pumped smoke into it. Smoke came out of the intake, which told us right away that it had a burnt intake valve. See what I'm saying? You see how that works? You know what I mean? We, we had it work. Huh? Where did you pump smoke into it? We just stuck it in for, into the spark plug hole. I mean, you know, we had that hose hooked up for the solar. You've done the solar leakage test. Yeah. Uh, we just took that... Uh, hose, I mean that cylinder leakage thing off and just pump smoke right into there and it just came right on out though. You know, you're supposed to listen to see where it comes from, but I say why listen when you can look, you know, because sometimes you won't quite hear it and if you listen, you know, you listen to the, into the uh, crankcase, you're listening, you're going to see if maybe there's bubbles coming up through the radiator, you know, if you get it full of water, you're also going to listen to the exhaust. But we, we saw it coming up through the intake, so we knew we had a... And pulling the heads off of that thing and putting all them timing chains on it and everything would have cost more than they paid for an engine. See? You get where I'm going? I mean, because if timing chain stuff is five, you know, four or five hundred bucks, you know, the timing chain cartridges and all them chains and all that hogwash, and then, you know, by the time you pull the heads off and get them redone and all that, and you pay the machine shop to redo the heads, you know, and valve job and all that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, they'd have a thousand dollars in an engine with two hundred ten thousand miles on it, and didn't even do anything but just, you know, do a valve job. <laughs> so I mean, really, they came out smelling a whole lot better. I mean, their bill was, you know, twelve hundred bucks or something. But technician A says during a power balance test, the cylinder that causes the biggest RPM drop is the weak cylinder. Technician B says if one spark plug wire is grounded out and the engine speed does not drop, a weak or dead cylinder is indicated. Can you guys find a weak or dead cylinder for me if I? Give you one that's skipping. How are you going to do it? Bingo. That's it. We like that. Now, we talked about this a little bit the other day. What if you pull a plug wire and it runs better? 
<laughs> First thing that comes to mind, somebody swapped them, or if it's got a distributor cap, you got you know, and it's one of the, and it's made out of the material or carbon track. If you got carbon tracks in a distributor cap, and you pull one of the wires and it runs better, that points you in that direction. Um, engine and crank and vacuum should be what? What should you see? 2.5 inches or higher, you're right. The low oil pressure warning light usually comes on when? When oil pressure drops dangerously low, which would be 4 to 7 PSI. You remember hearing me talking one day in here about this Dodge with a 318 in it. It was a 78 Dodge pickup. It wasn't all that old in them days. But uh, it started having a flicker in oil light. And I said, well, I don't know if I can trust that sending unit or not. So I just, uh, I just happened to have a, a kit where I could put a gauge on it. And when I put a gauge on there, I would run a piece of quarter-inch, uh, you know, uh, plastic line through some loom and run it in there. So you've got a uh, oil pressure gauge hooked up with a quarter-inch line. You know, it was pop that needle up there real good. And the oil pressure was still a little lower than it should have been. And it just happened kind of all at once. And so uh, I said, well, just watch that oil pressure really close, you know, on that gauge that I installed, and let's see how it does. Well, uh, they were driving it uh, a week or so later to Port Arthur, and it just came all to pieces. And when we got it out of there and tore it down, it, the crankshaft had broke. <laughs> and the crankshaft was cracked, and it was causing, you know, obviously the, the drilled passages through the crank, it was causing it to lose pressure when it got hot, and it finally just broke. You know, which all I did was get a long block, you know. You know what a long block is, right? That's the, the complete everything set up on it. Yeah, you buy a long block, you're getting the, the block with the crank, the pistons, and the heads on it. Usually it'll have valve covers on it, too. Uh, but ordinarily, you know, in most the cases... The short block doesn't have the head on it, right? Exactly. The short block doesn't have the head on it, so... Uh, but uh, Technician A says the first step in diagnosing engine condition is to perform a thorough visual inspection. Technician B says all these can be found by measuring straight up from where the oil drips on the floor. A only. A only. You're not going to measure. Why is it? What's wrong with what he said? Measure straight oh, up. Measuring. Okay. Too much. Yeah, and if they're driving down the road, that wind turbulence under there just paints the whole underside of that doggone car with oil. It may be driven from anywhere. You know, Luke's car had a, an oil pump gasket leaking, and those folks replaced the pan gasket because it was dripping off the oil pan, and they just assumed the pan gasket was leaking. Isn't that the one you told me? It was the one in the inside? That little O-ring in there, yeah. So you, it's like the job you did, except it was on my son's car whenever he was here last Thursday, you know. And, uh, and that, was a, that was a sunny boy, you know, getting that one. Uh, but I, Joe and, uh, and Moody did a good job on that car. He didn't leak no more oil after it left here. And I put a picture and made an invoice, you know, for him to show that other shop so they'd give his money back for charging him $400 to put an oil pan gasket on it. And then he drives it, uh, you know, before he gets 150 miles into his trip, right after he did that, he had, oil, had three and a half quarts of oil. You know, so anyway. Um, let's see. All of these are procedures that can help a service technician diagnose engine faults except what? Fuel level? Yeah, you're not going to really tell a whole lot about engine condition from a fuel level test. Technician A says an oil analysis by an engineering laboratory can reveal engine problems by measuring the amount of dissolved metals in the oil. You ever heard of that before? Yes or no? No, I know. Yeah, that is something you can do, but I don't know that anybody that I've ever, I mean, I've known of people, of places doing that, but, I mean, it, that can be troublesome and misleading, you know. I mean, it's okay, but it's one of the things that's not 100%. Te technician B says many engine-related problems make a characteristic noise. Which technician is correct? That's not like a That's a Charlie. Uh, technician A says a compression test can be used to test the condition of connecting rods. Everybody's shaking their head. Yeah, y'all yeah, are doing good. Technician B says cylinder leakage test fills the cylinder with compressed air. The gauge indicates the percentage of the leakage. That's a B. Yeah, she's doing good. Antifreeze mixed with engine oil can cause what? B. B and C. 
it, it congeals and becomes oh, thicker. Well, I guess, yeah. And that's, uh, whenever um, Chelsea Lee had to do that job taking that, uh, replacing that engine oil cooler at Saturn, the oil, the oil got into the coolant, and boy, did it ever look like peanut butter. Hey, hey I was looking for that truck, the, the red truck. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah, it's, um, y'all parked it out there, didn't you? Oh, on the backpack? Yeah, it's, it's parked over there. Now, did she ever get her work order made? Because I wasn't able to charge out her parts because the work order never was put in. Oh. She needs to take that over to Stacy. Okay. Yeah, take that over to Stacy first. Okay. And then I'll have to charge that stuff out. Okay. But, um, okay, um. 15. All right, now which one are we on? 15. Which of these smoke tops indicates excessive fuel being burned in the combustion chamber? Black. Black. Oh, yeah. Black smoke. Soot. Hydrocarbons. Unburned fuel. Which of these smoke tops indicates oil being burned? White. That's going to be C there. Now, white's the not. Well, white's going to be steam, right? And then, uh, which mechanical most mechanical problems are caused by which of these? High RPM, overheating, overcooling, or fuel loss? Overheating causes more than anything else, because not everybody drives their car at high RPM right, or, or over revs it, but a lot, a lot of it can overheat even if somebody's not driving it hard. Vehicles oil pressure warning lights on. Technician A says the oil pressure sending unit should be replaced and the oil in the vehicle rechecked. Technician B says mechanical oil pressure gauge should be used to check the oil pressure before replacing the sending unit. Be only. Yeah, that's going to be B only. That's not too complicated, no, you is got it? Me confused. Number sixteen. Hmm. He said, which of these smoke types indicates oil being burned in a combustion? That's blue. Oh, yeah. that's what I thought. Yeah, he said white. Somebody said white, and that's what I was addressing, you know. But, I mean, blue is actually what color okay. it is. Yeah. A thermostat can fail in which way? Stuck open, stuck closed, stuck partially open? Any of the Any blue. of the above. A skewed thermostat means what? Hey. Hey, it's not working, but not at correct temperature. That's what we've been running into with Katie's vehicle. We've had to put three or four thermostats in that doggone thing. I think we finally got a good one this time around. Because every time you turn around, she's getting a PO128 and it's running 160 degrees. A water pump can fail to provide the proper amount of coolant flow through the cooling system if what has happened? See? The no. impeller blades are worn or slipping on the shaft. Mm -hmm. Intake manifold gaskets on a V-type engine can fail due to what factor? All of the above. A defective thermostat can cause the powertrain control module to set what diagnostic trouble code? What did I just say a minute ago? 128. 128. 125 is one that means that it's even worse, you know, open and sooner. Uh, replacement plastic intake manifold may have a different design or appearance from the original factory installed part. Okay. Maybe, yeah, that's true. It can be. Torque specification for many plastic intake manifolds are in what unit? Pounds per foot. <laughs> pound foot per second. My goodness. Okay, now you're scaring me. Okay, it's pound inches. Inch, inch pounds. When replacing a timing belt, many experts and vehicle manufacturers recommend what other parts be replaced? Water pump. Yeah, if it's uh, all of the above, actually, camshaft oil seals, tensioner assembly, water pump. If it's hard to get to, and you think it might, you know, be a problem, it's a good idea to replace it. However, that being said, if you're working on something like a one of those Mazda Millenniums that has a supercharger on it, mm -hmm. uh, you can very easily, if you replace those pulleys and stuff like that, I mean, you can jack that bill up to $1,000 real fast just replacing the doggone timing belt. And it's, so you got to use discretion there. There's one thing. You don't want them coming back because you didn't replace something you should have, but on the other hand, you can go overboard on that. You know what I mean? Do Most have, of the people, huh? Do we have a sheet for removing cam? Cam, I mean crankshaft and cam. Well, there's one on breaking an engine down. You talking about the the crankshaft, crankshaft and the camshaft? Yeah. Or sealed? Yeah. There's 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 sheets on tearing an engine down, putting it back together. Oh, we already did that one. Yeah. I have. Yes, you did. When we did the F-150, you did. I didn't put no crankshaft and no camshaft. No, he didn't put it. Uh, we got another. We got some engines over here that hadn't even been touched that y'all can tear down. Oh, I got no, those. You're talking about the engine. Yeah, disassembling it, not swapping it out. No. All right, give me a number here. What do we got? 27. Hybrid electric vehicles usually require special engine oil of what viscosity? 
zero W twenty. All right. Technician A uses a steel gasket scraper on aluminum engine parts. Technician B uses a plastic or wood scraper on aluminum engine parts. Aluminum engine parts. Um, okay. You know this right here. You know we're supposed to teach this a certain way, but I'm sorry, a wooden or plastic scraper it just ain't gonna get the job done. A lot of the time, you know what I mean? I mean, that, they don't want you to gouging the aluminum, you know, but let's be serious. If you're careful, you can get away with using something like a razor blade. If the angle's right, you can clear that stuff off of there, you know, but a plastic or a wood scraper, I've never seen a plastic or a wood scraper I was happy with, you know what I mean? They're like, you just, you know, it's like a snap-on guy. He says, you're never supposed to break anything loose with a ratchet. You're supposed to use a little breaker bar, and then you break it loose, and then you take it off with your little ratchet. Please. You know? <laughs> Who pays any attention to that hogwash? Give me that ratchet. Yeah, break it loose, you know? All right. Uh, so anyway, uh, an intake manifold gasket has been replaced due to a vacuum leak. Which of the following steps uses a scan tool to complete the job? A. Torquing the manifold bolts. B. Refilling the cooling system. C. Air cleaner check. Or D. Idle relearn. Idle relearn? Yeah, yes, but I'm also, when I'm refilling the cooling system, you know how I like to put the big yellow numbers up on the screen with our wireless vehicle interface and watch that coolant temperature? I would say that that's another one. A vehicle has set a DTCP0172 indicating a lean exhaust and vacuum leak is suspected. This can be diagnosed by introducing what around the intake manifold gasket? Yeah, propane would be the best thing. You don't want to spray any gasoline around there if you can help it. On some engines equipped with a timing belt, the belt may also drive what? Didn't you say you made that uh, the water pump? Yes. Timing belt can drive the water pump. Timing chains can drive the water pump. All right, let's move on. Of course, it's not like we're running out of time, you know. Uh, a hybrid electric vehicle has a feature that could allow the engine to start and run without warning. Uh, that feature is called what? No, it's actually no, 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 uh, idle stop. Idle stop, that's right. Some of the right wiring under the hood of a late model vehicle is encased in bright orange covering. This indicates what? High voltage. Sure does. High voltage. Technician A says to use landman's gloves when servicing the high voltage system on hybrid electric vehicles. Technician B says hybrid vehicles have a plug to disable the high-voltage system before service. Well, right about that. Buffums. When changing a... Uh, okay, have you guys... How many of you guys have driven, you know, various different hybrid vehicles? You've driven them on? You know, it's kind of strange. I mean, you know, what happens is you, you start it up by just pushing the button or whatever. And it may start, it may not. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You basically... Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's you know, it's, we have, you think more clearly when you've been when you're eating while you're taking the test. All right. Let me see. Uh, okay. Uh, incidentally, the gloves that you use when you're doing a uh, when you're working on hybrids are um, kind of you got to have them checked every six months to make sure that they're not leaks. But you can check them for leaks yourself. By trapping some air in them and rolling them, you know, and getting a little, if you roll them up and they swell up a little bit and they and they don't leak down, pretty good chance there's not anything in them. But I'm going to tell you something interesting. I bought some gloves that was just one time just for the heck of it. I found some gloves, some high voltage 3,000 volt whatever gloves or 1,000 volt gloves on the uh, internet that I bought that were for working on hybrid vehicles. Okay, and then I put them, I just had them with me when I went up to that hybrid school just because I didn't know if I'd need any, you know. So. But he had some up there, and I bought some that he had along with some other stuff that he had. It was like $150. I bought that bag of stuff in there, you know. And I had a, I had a cat three meter and this kind of thing. And so uh, I went in there the other day to show somebody that stuff, Daniel. And when I took those, the red gloves that I bought from Amazon out that were, I think, were Chinese made, uh, those red gloves have just been in that bag in my office. It hadn't been particularly hot in there. And those red gloves, gloves had started to melt. They just started, I mean, they started to melt and stick to, the fingers were sticking to one another and it was like they were turning into jelly and 
So wait a minute, you're going to trust those gloves right there? I guess they're just supposed to be disposable. If I'm not mistaken, I think I paid 40 or $50 for that little pair of high voltage gloves. Huh? Yeah, they were just junk gloves. But now the gloves that I bought from Craig, uh, they're still flawless. I mean, now they need to be rechecked before I work on a hybrid with them because it's been a little more than six months since I've had them checked. But you're supposed to send them off and have them certified basically, before you're supposed to use them again. Mm -hmm. When you put those gloves on, you put a, a leather gloves over them, and that's so that you don't knock a little hole in that thing and, and all that, you know. The one time when I was welding, I had a little bit of a hole in my glove, and I didn't even, it's a little threadbare place I didn't know about, and I held this piece up under this forklift. Uh, we was building a forklift over there when I was, you know, working in that one place, and, we, and when I went to strike that arc, I touched the piece I was holding instead of, you know, where the the ground clip was hooked. I'm leaning against the engine and I'm oh, up under the floorboard and all of that juice went through me into that engine back there. And I saw fire in here and whenever it was over with I got a, had a big blister in my mouth and all kinds of stuff. I know it's like 200 amps and 220 volts, you know. And uh, well, if I, if I, I was leaning on the engine and it all, it, it, I had a good ground everywhere, man, you know. Sweaty, you know, salt, you know, come out of your pores and all that kind of stuff. And um, if I if I kill over with a heart attack in about ten minutes, it'll be because I did that in 1977. You know, whatever. So that was bad news, man. But I mean, that's, I hadn't. I've been shocked a lot of times, but not like that. You know, mm -hmm. but it made me mad. And I said, I'm gonna weld this thing on here before I get out from under here. And my hands weren't real steady, but I welded that thing on before I got out. But anyway, it was crooked and all that. <laughs> it wasn't on there straight, but I was going to weld it before I got out of that hole, you know. I wasn't going to be outdone by that, you know. I didn't even say anything to my supervisor about it. I just left it up. Okay, um, let me see. Uh, 35. When changing a timing belt, it's recommended that what also be replaced? Yes. Yeah, you know, one of the things that's really disgusting is when you've gone all the way in there and you were right there at a seal that you could have replaced and you, and you didn't replace it and you put all that garbage back together and now that daggum seal's leaking. Mm -hmm. Now what have I hammered as y'all just had about this? You pull an engine out, the torque converter sitting there hanging on the seal or if you know whatever, if you got the transmission over here and the seal's kind of hard and it's kind of old. It wasn't leaking before you pulled it all apart. You put it back together without giving any thought to the torque converter seal. You crank it up. Now you got you got transmission fluid dripping out of the wheel head. You got to go back. So you know how we always pull the torque converter out and put a seal in there. You know there's also a bushing in there behind it, but you don't have to replace that much usually. What about the real main? You might want well to change that too. If you're in there, you may as well pull that flywheel off and look at that real main. On this one that we did, the transmission on, it was a caravan that, that belonged to the same people that owned that we just worked on. The one you put the radiator in, they had an older caravan than that. Mm -hmm. And we pulled the transmission out of that one and rebuilt it back ages ago. I mean, it was probably five, six years ago. And uh, when we pulled the transmission out, I said, let's just go ahead and pull the flywheel off of that thing and just see what it looks like. Let me see if maybe, you know, we got any other kind of leaks up there. Not only did we have a leaking uh, rear main engine oil seal, which was very easy to get to at that point, but we also had freeze plug leaking on the back of that motor. And so while we got the transmission out, while we got the flywheel out, let's just replace them leaking freeze plugs and that seal. Now, so you put it all back together, and then your you know freeze plug starts leaking worse. You know, I've seen them freeze plugs look really really good on the outside, and be rusted completely away on the inside to the point of where when they start leaking, it's like a water pistol coming out of there. You know, just spray it. I had a picture of one of them I took, you know, on, a, on a, one of them caravans. Um, but anyway, uh, let me see. Uh, coolant leaking from an intake manifold can evaporate fast enough to leave no trace of a leak. True. That is absolutely true if it's leaking. Now, what else? If I've got an engine that's going low on coolant, and it's consistently going low on coolant, and I can't find it nowhere on the ground, but I keep having to add it. Into Head gasket is usually what's wrong in those cases, but the intake gasket can cause that too if it's blown in the right way. The intake gasket can dump coolant into the oil, or it can let it go into the one of the intake runners. And, and <clears throat> would it blow back and come through where the filter is? Well, you talking about uh, 
It, well, it depends on the configuration of the manifold. It's possible it could, mm -hmm. but ordinarily, if you're got if you've got something like that going on, your PCV system's not working because there's moisture in the crankcase because of you know you're making water when the engine runs, and if the if the PCV system is not working, you'll get moisture in the crankcase. It's going to sludge everything up, and sometimes you'll see steam, water, and stuff going back into where the uh, you know into the crankcase. If you've got a crankcase breather hose that goes into the air cleaner, you see, and, and that's usually because uh, two things, it'll be running too cold and also your PCV's not working, you see, I mean, but if your PCV's working like it's supposed to, it'll do that. If you pull that hose off going to your PCV valve, or most of them knowing they have a PCV valve, it ought to sound like a hurricane, I mean, shh, I mean, real loud. If you pull that big old three eighths hose loose from that PCV valve and you can't hear it or it's barely sucking, you better go find out where it's getting that vacuum and clear that out. That's what I'm trying to do with mine. Yeah, because you, you, you need a PCV system that's working this way. It'll cause all kinds of problems. Like you wouldn't believe a PCV system ain't working right. You know, so just make sure you know all that. Remember what I told you about if the, if the gasoline, somebody goes too long without changing oil and uh, gasoline, you know, winds up being mixed in with the. Uh, engine oil, it'll actually start changing your adaptive fuel tables to accommodate, you know, to uh, balance off that gasoline that's being pulled in through the PCV system. So there's a, all that stuff is pretty sensitive. It's, everything's got to be maintained. Now, listen here. In a situation where you're trying to see why one's not running right, um, one of the most brilliant things that you can do is to check your oil and coolant levels and make sure that you got good oil and coolant in there, you know, particularly engine oil. If your engine oil is really, really filthy and really, really thick, mm -hmm. and let's say that you're trying to find some kind of a fuel trim slash, you know, problem that you think has been oxygen sensor related or whatever, or maybe uh, the first thing you want to do before you do anything else is sell the customer an oil change. So let's go ahead and change the oil in this thing. You're right. And make sure your air filter is in good shape and you got a good clear fuel filter. Let's just start with the foundation before we go up with the house, okay? <laughs> you know what I mean? Let's don't go looking for something weird until we've fixed everything else. If the spark plugs have been in there for 170,000 miles and the oil is dark and thick and the air filter is clogged up and the PCV system's not working, you see, all that stuff needs to be looked at before you go looking for some strange something. You know, get all that stuff straightened out. Yeah, it's going to cost some money, but they should have already been spending that anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to make sure that everything else looks right. I, as a matter of fact, I had one guy, well, there was one guy doing air conditioner work. And this guy, it was funny to me, he actually uh, was busting his fanny, and he was a pretty good air conditioner mechanic, trying to figure out why the air conditioner wouldn't work like it was supposed to. And it turned out that the vehicle didn't have hardly no water in the radiator. <laughs> And, you know, a lot of them, if they get too hot, they'll kill the air conditioner compressor. Just shut it down. You know, and so he was scratching his head trying to figure this out and the other. All he needed was check the coolant. And y'all know how easy it can be for that to be low, don't you? <laughs> yeah. And uh, we had a coolant explosion here yesterday. You were around when that happened, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. You know what was lucky about that deal is that that coolant was cool. <laughs> it wasn't hot. Thing. He had pressure tested the coolant system. With that thing we got where we put shop air in it, it was 20 pounds of shop air pressure through a regulator. And she just goes, Well, I'll just take this thing right off of here. And it was like, Boom. I wasn't taking it off. Oh, was, I was trying to tighten it. Yeah. I didn't know it was one of the clamp ons. Yeah. I thought it was a screw on. Yeah, it just popped off. It just popped off of there. And it just wet her good. <laughs> and, uh, I wonder how that happened. Yeah. yeah. Willie, yeah. Willie come over here with it. His shirt was all wet. And I think she swallowed a bunch of antifreeze and wound up, you know, oh, we got I wound up sick as a dog for five hours. Yeah, so but uh, now if it had been propylene glycol, you'd have probably been okay because that's what they put in that Mio stuff that you put in your tea, you know. So I drink you know, propylene glycol, you know, they put it in there. Ethylene, uh, polyethylene glycol is a lot of times they use that for a laxative and all this kind of stuff. But I'm not oh. saying it's okay to drink antifreeze. Don't get me wrong with that. Well, whatever they put in yeah. it. If you drink antifreeze, you shall, you shall surely die, so be careful about that. <laughs> Um, I started fresh this morning when I woke up. <laughs> a, technician is, a technician is preparing to do an oil change on a hybrid vehicle. What special precaution needs to be taken before performing this service? B. B. All right. Uh, I would say, well, no, you don't disconnect orange-colored wire harnesses and change a wall. 
uh, he's supposed to, you're, it says, A is do not lift the vehicle more than 12 inches off the floor. That's pretty stupid. All right. B is make sure the ignition is off and the key is removed from the ignition switch. Okay. Typically, you just got a fob. Now, this is what you're supposed to do. Let's take that fob, and it doesn't say that here, but let's take that fob thing that enables you to start the car and whatnot, and let's carry that thing way off, like 50 feet away, and put it somewhere completely way under and gone from that car. You know what I mean? It doesn't need to be in range. It needs to be gone. Because what's really horrible is when you got it up on the lift and the oil's draining out and the engine says, I think I'll start up now. <laughs> what am I going to do? Well, same some, thing I did yesterday. Yeah. I got sprayed with oil. I, was under the hood of that, I got under the hood of a Ford pickup one time back in, gosh, it was 1985. And this was so stupid. I don't, you know, sometimes you just do stuff that makes you wonder if you were totally brain dead. So they say, it's like a 70 model Ford pickup that comes into the Ford dealership. And the Ford dealership had a huge shop in there. And so I say, it says, backup lights don't work. So I drop it in reverse. And I walk behind it, and I say, well, you know, backup lights working there. You know, of course, you got to have the key on for the backup lights to work. And then I check, I'm thinking like, I'm thinking switch, switch. Okay, the backup light switch is down there on the side of the transmission. And um, if I unplug this wires, which is right there at the back of the motor, and it has a six cylinder in it, and I can jump, if I can pull that harness up that goes into the truck and I jump it from power to those lights and they come on, then I'll know that I got a bad backup light switch or it's maladjusted or something, you know. And so I unplug this. Well, what else goes down there? The, yeah. So I, I'm under the hood with that thing. Maybe with my knees up on it, kind of like she was with my fanny up in the air. Head, you know, standing on my head behind the motor. And I touched the wrong wires and that sucker started up. And it was in reverse with me under the hood. <laughs> that was pretty dead gum scary. And if that transmission mechanic hadn't reached over and jerked the coil wire off, I don't know where it would have finally stopped, you know. I mean, it starts up, the engine's running and all that, you know. Well, this other guy was working on one over there, and he leans up under this little minivan or whatever it was, and, and he's got an old drop light with a bulb in it, and so he's up under here working on it. And, ow, the drop light burns him. You know, the engine's running. He jerks his elbow back. He knocks the hood prop out. The hood falls on him. Boom. His legs are sticking out. The engine's running. He's going, help. <laughs> And when everybody found out he wasn't hurt and nobody could quit laughing, you know. But anyway, <laughs> that's one of them things that just, just deteriorates on you. All of a sudden, poof, things come caving in them, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I could tell all those stories. Okay, let's see. Um, number Technician A says a leak in head gasket can be tested for by using a chemical tester. Wait, 37 uh, is B, right? Yeah, 37 is actually B, yeah. Technician A says a leak in head gasket can be tested by using a chemical. Let me back up for a second. When Brandon was in here, uh, Ballard, do you remember him? I don't remember anyone from now, but anyway, he was in here, and this woman had this uh, little Toyota or something. Didn't It looked like it, it had a place that looked like you were supposed to put a key, but there was no key there. Yeah, but if you had a fob in your pocket when you got in there that was for that car, the fob, you could just turn that thing and fire the car up and drive it away, you know. But if you didn't have that fob in your pocket, you could do whatever you wanted to with that thing, and it wouldn't do anything, you know. So I get in there, and I say, okay, this is how you start this car. Everybody watching? So at least it's dual enrollment students, so I started up. Mm. Get out. Okay, now. I got out of the car. Now you get in there and do that. Couldn't get it to do anything. I said, huh. I said, come on. Don't you know how to start a car? Let me get back in there and show you again. Mm. Switch it off. Start it back up. So he goes, but when I was doing it, I was saying, okay, car, you need to start now, you know, this kind of crap. So he he gets in there, and uh, he can't get it to start, and I get in there and start it again. And Brandon says, I've heard of these. This is one of those voice-activated cars. <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> but then I had to show him the fob, you know, and all that stuff. But, uh, so but the, the whole, a lot of this stuff, though, has got to do with when you walk up to the car, you can just put your hand on the... Uh, handle and open it without taking anything out of your pocket. You get in the car, you can start it by pushing a button. You don't have to put a key in and all that, you know. You, did, you gave me a car. What's that yellow car like that was here? That was uh, an Altima or something, I think. Park out there. Oh, wait. Really go get the car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was an 08 model, yeah. You got to put your foot on the brake for it to start, though. All right.
Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah, I was jerking him around, you know. But uh, anytime he put. I actually did that one time with the Ford dealer. I was walking across the Ford dealership. This was eons ago. Somebody had an aftermarket one, and I said, "This is an interesting looking fob. It was kind of clear and had a bunch of lights in it." And I mashed a couple of buttons on it and some lights lit up. I said, that was a cool fob. And then I stopped to talk to somebody for a minute or two. Then I headed out to the service lot. When I got out there, that explorer was sitting there running with the, with the doors locked. And I was like, what, what the heck? What's this? You know? You know? I mean, I had started it from uh, probably 200 feet away, you know? We put one of those on a car here. Uh, Tony Daniels, when he was here, and I rest his soul, he got killed in a car wreck later. But he actually, we bought a kit. And he put one on a car, and this girl, it was she wanted to be able to start her car while she was still in class on a cold winter day, and when she went out to get in the car, she wanted it to be warm and ready to drive off. And that's not really a problem because the steering wheel's locked. You know these yo-yos on these uh, adventure shows that come over here, and they pull something from under the dash, and they hotwire the car? Well, the darn steering wheel's still locked, and you can't put it in gear. Of course, they always do, somehow. You know what I'm saying? It's just real easy. And, and when they start it again later, they don't have to fool with them wires again. They just drive off, you know. That's kind of tough. All right. But anyway, uh, Technician A says what a leaking gasket, uh, that a leaking gasket can be tested for by using a chemical tester. Technician B says a leaking uh, head gasket can be found using an exhaust gas analyzer. Who's correct about that? B. But uh, basically, you can actually, I don't know why they say B, technician B, because you can, there are chemical testers for leaking head gaskets. What in the sound mill? So I think that, that's a messed up question there. Um, you know, whatever you put down there, you'll get that one right, because I don't like that question. The vacuum, vacuum reading shown was taken from an engine at idle speed. The vacuum reading shown was taken from a vehicle at idle speed. All right, you see that? See that vacuum reading? All right, what is that vacuum reading telling you? Anybody know? What vacuum reading are we getting there? B. About 18, huh? B. The engine is in good mechanical condition. 18 to 22 is what you're wanting for a healthy engine. Okay? All right. And that was all of our questions. So that was a painless test.